it true Ryan Ross hooked up with Pete Wentz? Not true. Close, though. There was, you know, drunken nights and oh, escapades. Man. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA. And when I say the word emo, what comes to mind for you? Probably Hot Topic, Swoopy Hair, and bands like Paramore, My Chemical Romance, and Fall Out Boy. But I'm going to add another thing to that list, which is Panic at the Disco. You know, this band. I chime in with a haven't you people ever heard of. And to say that their history is a little bit weird and complicated would be a huge understatement. They started out as teenagers in Las Vegas, then got signed by Pete Wentz before they had played a single show. And within the space of just a few months, they were all over magazine covers and had blown up on MTV as the new emo icons, with Rolling Stone even calling them, quote, the biggest new rock band in America. But within just a few years, they had become something very different. Panic at the Disco essentially became vocalist Brendan Urie's solo project, with his pivot towards becoming a pop solo artist becoming totally complete when he eventually did a feature with Taylor Swift. And all of that went hand in hand with quite a bit of controversy and even some tragedy. One by one, every single member of Panic at the Disco other than Brendan Urie eventually left the band, oftentimes under somewhat contentious circumstances, and with one former member even facing federal prison time. So how did it all happen? How did they go from spamming Pete Wentz on live journal to selling over 10 million albums and collaborating with the biggest pop star on the planet. And is Brendan Urie really an egomaniac that drove everybody else out of the band, or is there something more to it than that? Those are the questions that I will try to answer in this video. And also, this video is sponsored by Dungeon Hunter 6, the latest addition to the Dungeon Hunter franchise. After several releases starting in 2009, we now welcome the highly anticipated addition to this renowned series, and I can assure you that this was truly worth the wait. And best of all, it is absolutely free to play. Download it now using the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen if you're watching on a PC. Where you can loot and ride bosses. You can even summon up to three of them into battle with you. You can play with guildmates and battle in real time guild wars. So if you wanna check it out, download the game for free on both Android and iOS using my link in the description or scan the QR code if you're watching on a PC and you will get a special starter pack worth $50 using my link. You'll get 10 summoning scrolls, one SSR lieutenant called Demonic Wolf, and one accessory pack. And use your game account to enter the launch Lucky Spin event for free to win great prizes like an iPhone 15 Pro Max, PS5, Apple Watch, and more. Check out the description for more details. Panic at the Disco started in the summer of 2004, formed by their guitarist Ryan Ross, originally as a pop punk band called Pet Salamander, which changed its name to the Summer League, which again changed its name to Panic at the Disco once they recruited Brendan Urie, who was the last member of the band to join. They were teenagers at the time, I think mostly 16 or 17 years old, still in high school, and they only had a handful of songs. But that didn't stop them from trying to make a name for themselves. And the way they did that was pretty interesting. Ryan Ross was a Fall Out Boy super fan who was very active on their message boards and took a lot of inspiration from the band. For example, Panic at the Disco's super long song titles and his kind of poetic approach to their lyrics. All of that was very inspired by Fall Out Boy. And so, of course, they said, we need Pete Wentz to hear our band. And according to the band, here is what happened. We'd recorded a couple of demos on my laptop, put them online, and sent a link to Pete through his live journal. He listened to the stuff, and he drove down from Los Angeles to listen to us at band practice. So he heard us, and he signed us. And that was pretty much it. So instantly, we entered this high-pressure zone. And there's some debate over whether it happened exactly like that. But either way, it kind of doesn't really matter. The point is that the seemingly impossible happened. After just a few months as a brand new band, Panic at the Disco not only got signed, but they got signed by no less than their idol Pete Wentz on his brand new label called Decadence. And listening to it now, it's actually pretty easy for me to see why he was so excited about the band. Because honestly, listening to these demos, they sound absolutely amazing for a bunch of 16 year olds recording stuff in their bedrooms on GarageBand. Well, she was not bleeding on the bottom floor to 
The only problem was that for as talented as they obviously were, they had never played a show, they only had a few songs, and there was already the perception that they could never live up to the hype that they were generating online. And so with all of that, they went into the studio with Matt Squire, who originally played in the DC hardcore band Battery, which I would guess is where he knows Pete Wentz from, and went on to produce bands like All Time Low, as well as huge pop artists like Ariana Grande and Kesha, and they got to work on their debut album called A Fever You Can't Sweat Out. And the whole time, the question kind of looming in the background was, could they actually make an album that anybody wanted to listen to? Or were they just a product of the Pete Wentz hype machine? This was right around when Fall Out Boy was starting to blow up with From Under the Cork Tree. But even then, it was obvious that Pete was a brilliant marketer and he was pushing Panic at the Disco hard. For example, shouting them out in just about every interview that he did and wearing a shirt that said Pete at the Disco on stage. But they answered all those questions and more when their album came out the day after they went out on the Nintendo Fusion Tour headlined by Fall Out Boy in September of 2005. And by the end of the year, they were certified stars on the back of their debut single, I Write Sins, Not Tragedies. I chime in with the haven't you people ever heard of. The video blew up on TRL, the song hit number seven on the Billboard Hot 100, and it earned them five awards at that year's VMAs. And for context, as MTV themselves pointed out, that was more awards than Kanye West, Fall Out Boy, and Beyonce won combined. So for anybody who may not remember, that is how big and how hyped this band was. And as surprising as it may seem now for a kind of weird brand new emo band to get that popular that fast, it actually made perfect sense in the context of 2005. This was right after Taking Back Sunday and The Used hit the Billboard Top 10 and made emo a household name. The dance punk trend was also kind of gathering steam with bands like Block Party and their fellow Las Vegas natives, The Killers, who they sort of had some level of beef with. And Panic at the Disco channeled that disco punk kind of thing throughout the album, but especially on songs like Nails for Breakfast. That's when you something profound, the support on the line and with and in parallel to all of that, there was also this kind of weird revival of the 1930s cabaret kind of aesthetic, starting with the movie Moulin Rouge, and then making its way into videos like Lady Marmalade from that same movie, and Mr. Brightside by The Killers, and Panic at the Disco were kind of all of those trends rolled into one. Part emo, part synthy dance punk, part vaudeville circus aesthetics, and with the emo heartthrob duo of Brendan Urie and Ryan Ross as the face of the whole thing. But despite all that success, critics were not exactly kind to it. Pitchfork gave it a 1.5 out of 10, calling it, quote, a steaming pile of garbage, and concluding that, quote, the whining, the emotionally exposed lyrics, and the passionate choruses are there, but there's no sincerity, creativity, or originality. But as much as the critics hated it, the band was absolutely on fire. As MTV put it, Panic at the Disco went from being a bunch of random kids with truly amazing haircuts to chart climbing heirs apparent to the killer's throne all within the span of roughly five months. Their success also did a lot to really cement Pete Wentz as somebody with just an incredibly good eye for talent and trends. It was only the second release on his brand new label and he already had a platinum album. And he would go on to sign artists like Cobra Starship, Gym Class Heroes, and Nothing Nowhere, among many others, that proved that Panic at the Disco was not just a fluke. But even this early in the band's existence, cracks were beginning to show. The first one of those being the firing of their original bassist, Brent Wilson, in 2006, for allegedly not playing or writing any of his parts, and generally just not being up for the job. As Panic's drummer Spencer Smith said, Brendan and Ryan wrote all of the bass parts and Brendan recorded all of the bass parts. We had to simplify some of the bass parts that were recorded because Brent could not play them live. And so they did what they believed they had to do, replacing him and moving on. Going out on their 2006 headlining tour called Rhymes with Circus, which lived up to its name as just an absolute visual spectacle, basically like the I Write Sins Not Tragedies video coming to life on a stage. And with the band being seemingly unstable, Unstoppable. They released their second album, Pretty Odd, in 2008, which moved away from the dancey emo pop of their first album and more in the direction of like artsy, psychedelic pop, kind of like later period Beatles or the Beach Boys.
And to me, one of the most interesting details about Pretty Odd is that where Ryan Ross wrote pretty much all of the first album, this one was much more collaborative. As Brendan Urie said at the time, on the first record, it was mostly Ryan writing all the lyrics, and this time around, everyone had a hand in it. Which kind of made a lot of people wonder, is Ryan actually the thing that made Panic at the Disco great? The album got generally positive reviews, even from a lot of the critics that hated their first album, but fans were not so happy with the change of direction or with the band dropping the exclamation point from their name, which apparently was a big deal to the emo kids at the time. We've taken away the exclamation mark and, and put in two periods. Yeah. It, so, you know, Fun with, punctuation. Fun with punctuation. But despite the strong reviews, the album was a semi-flop, selling far less than a fever you can't sweat out. And speaking of Ryan Ross, the next big shock for the band came in 2009 when he left Panic at the Disco along with their bassist John Walker, citing creative differences. As he said, John and I had been writing a bunch of stuff on the road and it just got to a point where we were off tour when we were talking about getting together and working on this stuff that it became pretty apparent that we weren't all wanting to go in the same direction. And this was huge because, again, it was essentially Ryan's band in the beginning. He started it, he wrote almost all their most popular songs, and as Brendan himself later described his own role, I felt like I was the last guy who joined and you guys just included me. I just wanted to hang out with those guys. And so Ryan walking away kind of raised the question of, is this still even Panic at the Disco? And although both Ryan and Brendan insisted that it was an amicable split, fans were divided. But most of them seemed to take the position that Ryan was the one to blame because in their view, he'd become more interested in partying and being a rock star than in making music. And obviously I don't know what was actually happening behind the scenes, but from the outside, it certainly seemed pretty credible. He was often spotted hanging out with Pete Wentz in the sort of Hollywood scene, appearing in paparazzi photos and stuff. And shortly after he left the band, a photo circulated of him in some fancy house with a bunch of girls and an absolutely giant plate of cocaine right in the middle of the photo. But once again, despite the lineup changes, the band kept moving forward, releasing their very first song without Ryan's input called New Perspectives, which was noticeably more pop than anything else they'd put out before. This was followed by their third album, Vices and Virtues, in 2011, which was kind of a return to the look and sound of a fever you can't set out, but maybe with a little bit more polish. But despite having the name Panic at the Disco on the cover, you could already tell that this was starting to be positioned by the media as more like Brendan's solo project than as a band. But before I go on, if you like this video, please check out my second channel. It's a little bit more loose and fun, so if you want to hear me talk about which front men I want to be friends with and invite to my barbecue or my Final Fantasy tier list, hit the link in the description of this video. And the next big move for Panic at the Disco came in 2013 with the release of their next album, Too Weird to Live, Too Rare to Die, when Panic at the Disco's founding drummer Spencer Smith announced that he also was leaving the band to focus on his growing problem with addiction. As he said, I was taking a dangerous amount of pills while drinking to chase that high, and just like with any other substance, the higher the high is, the lower the low is. What started out as a way for me to numb anxiety and depression had become the major cause of it. And once again, the band continued on, this time with Brendan as the only original member, supported by touring and session musicians acting as hired guns. But all this instability wasn't slowing them down. The album hit number two on Billboard, and it seemed like they were hitting a new peak of popularity, but with a new sound that was a little bit more like Imagine Dragons than My Chemical Romance. which in my opinion is really what kicked off Panic at the Disco's era as a solo pop act. First with 2016's Death of a Bachelor, and then with 2017's Pray for the Wicked. Both albums hit number one on Billboard, and Pray for the Wicked featured their biggest single yet, High Hopes. The song was a top 10 hit in something like a dozen countries and spent like an entire year on the charts. And so somehow, almost 15 years after starting, Panic at the Disco was more popular than ever, but in a new version that was almost unrecognizable from their origins. They started out as teenagers with Ryan Ross worshiping Fall Out Boy from afar through their message board and writing and recording demos in his bedroom on GarageBand. But somehow along the way, they had turned into Brendan Urie's solo pop act and enlisted 
enlisted a small army of pop producers for songs like High Hopes, including people like Sam Hollander, Taylor Parks, and Jonas Yeberg, who collectively had made hits for artists like Selena Gomez, Ariana Grande, and Katy Perry. Panic at the Disco may have been at the top of their game, but all good things must come to an end. After releasing their final album, Viva Las Vegas, in 2022, Brendan announced that he was ending Panic at the Disco to focus on his new life as a father. And so that brings us to the last question, which seems to be at kind of the center of the Panic at the Disco conversation, which is, what happened? Is Brendan Urie what so many people seem to think he is? This narcissistic egomaniac that slowly but surely pushed everybody out and made the whole band about himself? Well, I obviously don't know what actually happened, and I don't know anybody in the band or involved with the band, so I'm completely speculating, but here are my thoughts. First of all, it's very clear to me that Ryan Ross in particular is just a freakish gifted musician. If you listen to those demos that they did back when he was like 16 years old, they're just like ridiculously good for anybody at any age. He's just one of these people who was born with absolutely elite God-given talent. And the unfortunate fact is that those people tend to come with a lot of demons. We've seen this play out a million times, and it seems like unfortunately that was the case for him as well. And with the other members, it seems like they probably also had some underlying issues that were compounded and exaggerated by the fact that they became extremely famous at a very, very young age. Like just to put in perspective how young they were, a couple of them had to finish high school online while they were on their very first tour. And as we've seen with so many child stars over the years, that level of fame, and I guess specifically the entertainment industry, seems to be one of the most toxic, dysfunctional environments that someone could possibly grow up in. If you had any issues going into that, well, it is definitely gonna make them much, much worse. And unfortunately, it seems like that is what happened to them. It seems like their issues got the better of them, which ultimately just left Brendan as the last one standing. It doesn't seem to me like there was any calculated effort on his part to push everybody out, it seems like one by one, they sort of took themselves out of the game. And from his perspective, why wouldn't he replace those people with hired guns? Why would he give, for example, their new touring drummer a piece of the band that they didn't start? Now, all of that is not to say that Brendan is perfect. He is only human, so I'm sure that he's made plenty of mistakes just like the rest of us. But as far as the narrative that he's some sort of evil mastermind that screwed everyone else over, personally, I don't see that. To me, this just looks like a lot of people who got very famous, very young, and unfortunately cracked under the pressure. And again, like I said, I have no idea what did or didn't happen, so all of that is complete speculation on my part. But what I do know is that an entire generation will always remember this. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. And also, I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the True Cult level or above. Patrons get all my videos and podcasts early. I do giveaways. There are members-only channels in my Discord that I'm super active in. And there's also a way to have me review your music. So if any of that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm gonna sign off for now, but I will see you next time.